our God. Oh, let's worship him in this place. Let's let him know how great he is. Lord, there is none other. There is none higher. There is none greater in all the earth or in heaven above. You're worthy in this place. You're worthy in our hearts. You're worthy in our minds and in our bodies. You are high and lifted up, Lord Jesus, in your praise. It surrounds us. Your glory is in this place. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. We enthrone you in this place and in our hearts and our minds, Jesus, to do your work. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord, there is none like you. There is none like you. There ever was or will be. There is only one. He's so unique. He's so special. He, you're never going to find another one like him. You're never going to find another one quite like Jesus. I'm so thankful that I know the one and the only. Tonight I want to turn your attention to the book of Mark chapter 8. And verses 34 through 37. Mark chapter 8 and verses 34 through 37. I enjoyed the, the worship and the song selection and, and everything. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate hearing about the coming of the Lord in those songs. I appreciated the hearing and the references to the cross. I'm glad that we're a church that believes in those things and preaches those things. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 through 37 says, this is Jesus, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? Tonight I'd like to talk to you from conviction to Calvary. From conviction to Calvary. Lord Jesus, I'm in awe of your presence. I am, I am thankful for what I feel in this place. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are going to have your way. And I preach with expectation that you're going to touch hearts, minds, souls, bodies, people that are both here and outside of this place, Lord Jesus. I believe in the powerful effect that you are going to have in our lives as we make ourselves obedient of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 4, This is the last and final moments of Jesus's life upon this earth and in, in fleshly form. He he uh, before his crucifixion. It says, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. This was Judas speaking Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus. He said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? He thou to that. They disregarded the fact of what he had done and, and Judas now knowing what he had done, he had caused for the shedding of innocent blood, that being Jesus Christ. He of course was not alone in the matter. 
we can read through the scripture and we can find that there were others who, of course, were involved. The chief priests and elders, it says in verse 20 of the same chapter, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The very elders, the, the high priests, the, uh, the chief priests, the elders, the men that were supposed to be deciding the, the spiritual framework of the, of the body of believers in that day, instead of influencing to good, were influencing to evil. They were suggesting a, a murderer and, a, and an insurrectionist be brought forth as the one who was given life as opposed to Jesus, the man with innocent blood. You read a few scriptures down in verse 22. They, they began to cry out and they say, crucify him. What, what should I do with him? This Jesus. What shall I do with him? This is what was asked. Pilate asked them and they said unto him, let him be crucified. And they continued to roar. And we, we know the story of how Pilate, he comes and he takes the basin of water and he he cleanses his hands and he says, my hands are clean. My hands are clean of this. I don't want his blood upon me. And in verse 25, I think this verse is very prophetic in what it says. It says, then answered all the people and said this in regards to what Pilate had just done and said, he, they said this, his blood be on us. His blood be on us and on our children. And I don't know if they knew the full capacity of what they were saying right there. Because maybe they thought, yes, if he was evil, if he had done wrong, sure, the blood be upon our hands. Yes, we were the ones who killed him. But so much more did they not realize that it was going to be his very blood that was going to cover and wash every single sin that they had ever committed. His blood be on us for the promises unto you. And unto your children. And they said, and on our children. His blood be on us and our children. This evening as I was preparing, I couldn't escape two things upon my heart tonight. The blood and the cross. The blood and the cross. That beautiful innocent blood that was shed on Calvary. Judas recognized it. And whether the people that day were aware of it or not, he was the innocent, he was the holy, he was the separated, he was the one and the only perfect that no other had ever known, never was, ever will be, or was at that time. And they said his blood be on us and our children. It's such a powerful thing to think about because earlier, as Jesus was meeting with his disciples previous to his crucifixion, he met with them in, in a upper room for a supper. And he, he says this to them in giving them the bread and giving them the wine and saying, take, this is my body. This is my flesh. So you can be able to remember. Take this. And he says this in verse 28 in regards to the cup. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He knew what he was about to take part in. He knew that there would be no remission of sins if there was no bloodshed. Without the shedding of his very perfect and innocent blood, there could be no remission. There could be no washing. There could be no cleansing. There could be new, no new life. There could be nothing without the blood. And the blood could not come forth without the cross. He went from a time of being convicted. All those around him said he was wicked. They said that he was uh, despised, that he was the one that had caused problems and, and errors, and, and he was coming against the doctrine and the truths that they had hold, held so dear for so many centuries. And they said, this man in our eyes is convicted. He's wrong. He has done that which is despicable. He calls himself God. He calls himself a king. He calls himself all these things, but we don't identify him as that. The conviction was made. 
And I can just imagine it in my mind's eye. They had already beaten him. They had already tore his flesh even up into that point. So that by the time he was on the cross, it says that he was unrecognizable. You could barely recognize him as a man. You couldn't, he, his fleshly appearance was so marred. And Isaiah talks about how this would be the case. That this would be the case that he'd be unrecognizable. His body tore from head to toe, bleeding forth. It was not a clean trip from the conviction to Calvary. The road to Calvary was marked with bloodlines. The cross being carried on his shoulder, every step a footprint of blood, dripping from his garment, dripping from his head, tip of his nose onto the ground, from his hands and from his feet, even before he got to the cross. You could know the route that Jesus took from conviction to Calvary because you followed the blood. You'd follow the bloodline and you could see every step that he had taken going through Jerusalem and up Golgotha to the top. You knew the path he had taken. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11, uh, that's where I'm going to start. It says, but Christ being, came, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So he's our high priest, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, verse 14, how much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, he was without sin, he was innocent blood, there was nothing to convict him, and yet he was convicted. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Convicted and yet innocent. Torn, beaten, and despised. Rejected, hurt, and pained. Bloodied from head to toe. Scraped and beaten. And yet, innocent blood. And it was that same blood that made those lines from that conviction point to that point of Calvary. It was those same blood that would cover their hands and it would cover their heads and it would flow upon them so that they could have a new birth. Peter talks about it when on the day of Pentecost, he said, you know that person you killed. You know that person you crucified. You know that person. You can see the stains of his blood on the walkway. You can see it. You can see it so clearly. It's still there and you can follow it and you can see where it takes it takes from conviction to a point of Calvary. And that's what I want to take you from tonight. I want to take you from a point of conviction in your own heart. And take you to a point of Calvary. Where you say, I'm not satisfied with where I'm at. I feel the pain and the burden of sin that's upon my life. But I'm taking it to a point of the cross. Where I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And I'm going to rise again a new creature. I know what I I was. I feel the conviction of it. I feel the pain of it. I feel the stripping of it. But I know that there's a Calvary that'll kill this dead flesh that has held on to me for so long. That has caused me to lust. That has caused me to fulfill the works of the flesh. I know the burden. I know the pain. And it aches me. And yet in myself, in my own shedding, I could do nothing with my blood, but I've been covered. I've been covered. I've been covered from conviction so I could get to my own personal Calvary. 
Do you feel that resonate within your heart right now? That's called conviction. When you begin to think of every drop of blood, when you begin to think of every footprint of blood, when you begin to think of that bloodline leading from his innocent conviction to the final pouring out of his very life on Calvary. From conviction to Calvary. Where will you allow your conviction to take you? Where will you allow your conviction to take you? Will it just remain in the streets? Or will it take you to a place of transformation? Where you're not the same person you once were. And I know about initial, the, uh, uh, the initial, uh, I know who I'm speaking to tonight. The majority of us have repented, been baptized, received the gift of the Holy Ghost, are striving and walking in this newness of life and holiness. I understand that. But there is a conviction that we can feel to remind us to continue following the path of the bloodline that goes from conviction to Calvary, from conviction to Calvary. There's a reason that Paul said, I die daily. He didn't want to be satisfied with just waking up in the morning and being the same person he was the day before. He wanted to wake up saying, I'm a fresh new man. I'm a fresh new woman. I'm a new child of God. I'm not what I was yesterday, last week, last month, when I first initially received the gift of the Holy Ghost and was baptized in his name. I'm not the same person person and that means I got to take myself from conviction to Calvary from conviction to Calvary from conviction to Calvary each day because I want to be a new man I want to put off the old man and put on the new oh, I am a new creature with Christ but the only way the newness comes the only way new life comes if I'm willing to go from conviction to Calvary and on Calvary it's a cross on Calvary, it was a cross. If you'd pull up Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. And for this cause, for this reason, because he was willing to be the sacrifice, the perfect bull or goat that that sacrifice as was shown in the old testament he said i'm going to be for the fulfillment of that because that he is the mediator of the new testament he's the one who stands in the gap between the old and the new he's the one who stands in the gap between your old and your new that by means of death, because of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, because of your sins, because of the places you went, because of the things that you did, because of the thoughts that you thought that were under the first testament, in the life that you once knew, in the life that you once lived, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. I want to tell you tonight that you have an eternal inheritance. And sometimes we so easily forget that. But you see, in the process of going from the conviction to the cross, you have to follow the bloodline. And when you get a hold of the bloodline, you get a bloodline. Let me tell you that again. When you follow the bloodline, you get into the bloodline. You got to follow the bloodlines of Christ from the conviction to the Calvary. If you ever hope to be able to get into the generation, if you ever be, want to get into the being his child, if you ever want to be, become his son or his daughter, the only way that happens is going from conviction to Calvary. Because that's where the bloodlines are. And that's how you get into the bloodline. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says this. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. That's how they did all the old things in the Old Testament. Blood was required. If they wanted sin to be purged, it had to be through the law, which required blood. And without shedding of blood, wait a second, this sounds like what Jesus was saying. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. That's what he said in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. He says, if my blood is not poured out, there's no remission. There's no washing. There's no renewing. There's no cleansing. There's no new, no new life. I'm thankful for the blood. I'm thankful for the blood because of the new life. I'm thankful for the 
for the blood because of the heritage it gives me. I'm thankful for the blood that I can follow that bloodline to be able to bring me from conviction to Calvary each and every day that I live so that I can be the man that he wants to, me to be, so that I can live the way he wants me to be. I don't understand everything along the path, but if I keep my eyes on the bloodline, I know that I'm going to reach the pinnacle point. I know that he's going to lead me right where I need to go, that I'm going to be right where I need to be. I read the entry verse this, this evening in, Math, in Mark chapter 8 verse 34 through 37. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, follow me. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following me. That's what he called them to do. The bloodline's there. Will you follow it up that mountain? So many times we want to follow him up the mountain to be able to reach, to hear him speak when he goes up to the mountain of transfiguration. You see, feel the Shekinah glory of God and you see the, the miraculous and the powerful and the revelatory. We want to go up the mountain of transfiguration. Many times we want to go up the mount to hear his sermon, the sermon on the mountain. We want to be able to hear the, the orations and the teachings that he, he speaks. But there's very few times that we want to go from conviction to Calvary on Golgotha. This is a mountain that's not easy to tread, but it's well marked. The bloodline's already there. You see, following the bloodline to the cross is what helped save me from conviction to the cross on Calvary. What will you do when you feel conviction tonight? Will you go to the place of sacrifice to deny yourself, to repent, to turn to him? Or will you just continue on your way? There's a call. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, it talks about how Christ became sin for us. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He went to the point of sacrifice so he could become sin. He became the very sin so that all, all things in the world could be laid upon his shoulders and that it could die right there. Every sin, every problem, every issue, every lie, every thing stolen, every cheating, every murder, every adulterous act, every fornication, every mean and evil and wicked thing that has ever taken place, past, present, and future. He said, I take that upon myself. I become sin and I die so that we could be his. I will take the curse. I will take the burden. I will take the pain because he knew we couldn't handle it. He knew we couldn't make it because like I entered this, this evening with, there's only one who's ever been innocent. There's only one who has innocent blood. There's only one who was perfect, even in conviction, falsely accused, and yet willing and able to suffer. You and I could not receive an inheritance without the blood, and following the blood line led us into the bloodline. Following the bloodline led us into the bloodline. And we had to die in order to be born again so that we could be a part of that bloodline. If you would turn to Galatians 3, 26 through 29, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we entered in. It was by faith. We believed what he said was true. Verse 27. For as many of you 
as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When we came into the waters of baptism, it wasn't just something that we did to be able to show that, yes, I signify that I, I believe in Jesus Christ. It was so much more than that. It was showing that we were now covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we received a new identity. Remember I said his body was so torn and mangled and broken that you couldn't recognize him? He was willing to go through the pain of breaking his own identity as a Jew, as a man, as a person, as a teacher, as a scholar, as a person with renown, and he was willing to have that all stripped away of his own identity. So blood could pour forth so you could have a new identity. He was willing to forfeit his own identity so you could have an identity. And he said, the only way you're going to be able to get one is if mine stripped away from me. If mine is tore up, beaten, and bruised, where I'm unrecognizable, but they'll see the blood on your life, and they'll recognize something different about you, so that when they see you, they say, that man, that woman, they've been with Jesus. That man, that woman, they've been in the presence of God. That man, that woman has prayed. That man, that woman has been covered. That man, that woman has been in the word. Can someone say that about you? Can somebody say that about you? Can someone look at your life and say, there's something different about that person. They have a different identity than anyone else I've ever met. There's something different about them. Why is there something different about them? Why is there something different about us? It's because of Jesus Christ and his blood that is upon my life. Because me and when my flesh comes out, I am wretched. I am worthless, but I am worth everything and I am worth full and I have everything because of the blood that is upon my life. I'm so thankful for the precious, the priceless, the ever loving, gracious love of God. For with that love, he died and by that love, he gave so that I could be what I am today and have what I have and love what I love, which is him. Verse 28. There is no, neither Jew nor Greek. There's no bond nor free. There's no, neither male nor female. Why? Because you've been given a new identity. For you are one in Christ Jesus. He doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. He doesn't care if you're a Jew or a Greek, whether you have a heritage, whether you grew up in this thing, or you just got baptized and received the Holy Ghost within the last couple of weeks. You're his. You're his child. You're his. You were once bound, but now you're free. You may think, yes, I have been free, and I've been free for many years with Jesus. Well, you know what? You're part of the church. Find someone else. Help them to become free. He doesn't matter your state. He doesn't matter your, your economic state, your relational state, your, your past or your present. But he is concerned about this. Are you mine? Do you have my identity upon your life? Have you been washed in the blood of the lamb through baptism? Have you repented of your sins? Have you gone from that point of conviction and taken your place at the cross? Have you kneeled at an altar at a place of sacrifice and said, I'm willing to give up of my life. I'm willing to give up of my heart, my mind, my soul, my desires, my wants, my beliefs. And I'm putting it all down, Lord Jesus, because I want you. I want this new identity that this crazy man behind the pulpit is talking about. I want what he has has because what I have is worthless it's wretched and it's not enough to sustain me or keep me or bring me forward and you may think yes I was baptized yes I've received the Holy Ghost but when's the last time you went from conviction to Calvary when was the last time you got on an altar and said I want something a little more I'm dying daily I deny Justin Bishop I pick up my cross and I'm following you I deny my flesh I'm picking up my cross and I'm following the bloodline because I'm wanting to be with Jesus. I want the heritage. I want the identity. I want this new life because everything else is worthless. It means nothing. And since I've died each day, 
All those things in my past, they're dead to me. And everything I've ever found in this word, it's, it's so fresh, it's so new, it's so what I need. Verse 29. And if ye be Christ's, then, I love this, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Because Abraham, you see, the reason that he received an inheritance in the first place is not because of sacrifice. It, it wasn't because he had a bunch of rules he needed to follow. But he had faith in a promise. Let me promise you this. And I know it, it's true because it's in the word. Going from conviction to Calvary works. Going from conviction to Calvary works. It worked for me and it'll work for you. You see faith and belief in that very promise. The promises that God gave Abraham, his faith in it, is what helped him become an inheritor of promises and blessings. Not only for himself, but for his children. And your faith and your belief and the degree by which you give it to the promises that God has placed in your life. Those things bring you into the inheritance of God because you believe it. Because you had faith and you walked with God and followed him and denied your own self and said, this is the only thing I'm going to go towards. Abraham left all family, friends, and things that he knew. And it says that he sought for a city whose builder and maker was God. I'm seeking for a place whose builder and maker is God. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. And I don't want just the promise to be for me, but for my children and my spiritual children and every man and woman and child that I have an opportunity to be able to reach out to. I want to see it for you. I want to see it for your loved ones. But before I can ever help anybody else, I truly got to believe and have faith like Abraham did. That what this promises in this Bible say are true. And that it's going to lead me into the paths of righteousness. And it's going to lead me in the right way. And it's going to bring me in the way that I should go. And I'm going, I'm not going to, it's not going to lead me astray. But that it's going to bring me to where I need to be. And if I can have faith. That if I go from this conviction that I feel to a point of Calvary, that something's going to happen in my life and for the people I pray for. In Galatians 4, 4 through 7, a little after that, it says that, of course, we just read that we were inherit, we became gained inheritance into Abraham's family through faith. We became a part of his lineage, his seed, through Jesus Christ. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Verse 6. And because ye are sons... God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, I have a relationship now. I have something I did not have before. Verse 7. Wherefore, because of all this, thou art no more a servant. You're no more bound. You're no more under bondage. 
you're no more under the pain of your past and your predicaments, but you're a son, you're a daughter. And if you're a child of God, if you're a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. How do I get to God? How do I get to God? I need to follow Christ. Christ was the manifest form of God on earth. He was fully God and fully man. If I want to get into the presence of God in a greater way, I need to follow his Christ. I need to follow his manifestation. I need to follow his word. I need to follow it day in and day out because it's the only thing that's going to lead me because along that path is the bloodline from conviction to Calvary. Galatians 2.20, if we'd all stand in this place. Paul said this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, look at me, I'm still here, I live. Yet not I. It's not me. It's not the person that you used to know. Why? Because I have a new identity. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the what? The faith. I believe that what happened to me worked. I believe that what could happen to me could work. I believe that what this word says is true. That by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe it. So I ask yourself tonight. I ask you. I ask myself. Are you willing to go from conviction to Calvary? Are you willing to go from just knowing Christ to a place of sacrifice? A place that says it's not about me anymore. Denying yourself, picking up the cross, and following him. Easier said than done, I know. But just as Christ made those words in Matthew chapter 8, 34 through 37, I encourage you in coming to this altar, I invite you, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me from a point of conviction to a place of Calvary. From a point of conviction to a point of Calvary. He's not done shaping you. He's still teaching you how to be his child. You're learning your identity each day, but it's only from following the bloodline. Lord Jesus, we come to this altar in recognition, this physical act as a spiritual representation that I am going to deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow you. We have felt, Lord, the pain. We know, Lord, the innocence by which you had. And Lord Jesus, we want to be transformed. Today we die. I die today, Lord Jesus, so that I can become the man you want me to be. I put off my carnal nature. I put off my past. I put off my sin. I put off my arrogancy. I put off my pride. I put off my doubts. I put off my inconsistencies. I put off my, my, my good things and my bad things. I put off my worst and my best. I put off everything that I am or ever was. I put it off, Lord. I deny it. I say it's no longer me because I want the blood upon my life instead. I want that to shine through. I want the blood to be the only thing that they see on my life. I want them to recognize that I've been in your presence, that I have the touch of your identity upon me. Oh, Lord Jesus.
I want to be your child. I want to be your son. I want to be yours, Lord. Each and every day, for every child of God in this place, for every man or woman or child that aspires, Lord Jesus, they've heard the words that I've spoke, Lord, that they would feel that conviction within their heart and that they would desire, Lord Jesus, to, to have a new life. Whether they are saved or sinner, whether they are seeking or, or they don't even know where they're at, Lord Jesus, take them, Lord. Take them. Take each of us, Lord, and help us to follow you. Help us to pick up the very things that you've placed upon our shoulders. This word, your spirit, let us to carry it with us each and every day. Let me not neglect it. Let me not lay it aside, but let me walk with it daily, Lord Jesus. Help me to walk with you. Help each and every one of us to walk with you, Jesus. I'm expecting a day, God, when I'm going to see you. When I'm going to see you high and lifted up and on your throne. I've gone up mountains to hear your word. I've gone up mountains to see your glory. I'm going up a mountain tonight, Lord Jesus, to go from conviction to Calvary and sacrifice. But one day, Lord Jesus, I'm going to go from this earth and I'm going to go up to the mountain of God and I'm going to reach to your very feet and I'm going to cast my crown before you. And you're going to be the only thing in my eye that I'll see. The only thing that my heart's desire finally seen and the only way I'm going to reach you is because I kept following the blood. I kept following the blood I kept following the blood I love you Jesus I love you Jesus I love you Jesus